you know, there's an argument to be made that since we don't use marijuana, we don't really understand the benefits and we don't really understand what we're talking about. How, how would you, what do you think about that? We would hate for us as doctors to like recommend something and then all of a sudden we find out later how bad it is. And we, we've seen that being the case for opioids. Let's say I've got depression or PTSD and people say like, oh, I, you know, I use marijuana to cope. What do you think about that? Again, you know, the studies are limited. It's very difficult to, to study cannabis in the U.S. It's still a Schedule One drug, meaning it has high abuse potential in the same category as LSD. You know, if, if I'm using a substance just at a very high level, if I'm using a substance to numb my emotional state, my brain's ability to control and regulate my emotional state becomes less necessary. Um, how do you know if you're kind of like addicted to marijuana or not? I, is this live or is this still part yeah, of Yeah, no, we're live. <laughs> okay, we're, here we go. We're good to go. Okay, Great. so I'm going to go All ahead right. and, and switch over so people, why don't we just start, uh, welcome, Michael, or Dr. Yeah. Shu. How do I, how do we pronounce your last name? Yeah, Dr. Shu, you, um, you said it just right the first time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I you just want to say a couple of quick things up front, maybe. Sure. Uh, I think, first of all, just a quick... Uh, disclaimer for viewers. One thing is that, um, you know, I recently joined the Scientific Advisory Board of Healthy Gamer. Did want to put that out there. Um, and I know that's something that might be announced later on this week as well. Sure. Um, I am, you know, a physician at Brigham Women's Hospital um, and part of the Harvard Medical School sort of residency training program here. But all the opinions that I'm going to put out here are mine and mine alone. And, um, you know, I think uh, there's a lot uh, to talk about with cannabis, and I think there's sort of ways that people are talking about it in terms of how it's like a completely harmless substance. And I think, you know, that may not, that's, you know, not sort of a helpful way of thinking about it. But at the same time, uh, I might challenge something you said a little bit earlier, too, that it's a completely bad thing as well. And I think that sort of the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And sure. um, I hope we can sort of uh, be able to converse around that um, today and uh, sort of also uh, acknowledging, you know, both uh, both of us are psychiatrists, so there's always sort of biases that we have, uh, you know, going into these things. We have biases towards mental health and health in general. Um, you know, some people might have biases towards autonomy or freedom of choice and things like that or biases based on personal experience. Um, bias, we have biases based on you know, looking to evidence of literature, which I believe is the right thing to do when you're talking about drugs, maybe not so much spiritual experiences or things like that that don't have sort of the harmful effects that drugs could have. But certainly when thinking about medications and drugs, I think it's helpful to um, to do that. Um, and bias is based on obviously personal and spiritual experience. And I think it's just helpful to put out there sort of what our biases are, because without acknowledging that, uh, arriving at the truth might be a little bit challenging. And I think acknowledging yeah. all of our biases in it. So. Well said. I mean, I, I think when I have conversations with people about marijuana, oftentimes it's interesting. You use the word bias, whereas I, I wonder if like value, I mean, I think there are biases, but also like there are differing values. So like as mental health professionals, we're probably going to have a value that health is not, I wouldn't say, uh, actually, I, I don't think I value necessarily health over autonomy because ultimately when I work with many patients, you know, it's their choice what they put into their bodies. Um, Fair enough. Uh, but at the same time, I think, like you said, I've sort of noticed that sometimes people are kind of coming with a certain personal experience. I wouldn't quite say agenda, but sometimes when I work with people who use substances, the conversation almost turns into looking for any kind of justification to be able to continue to use the substance. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's been my experience sometimes with people. So I, I, I really appreciate your, you kind of pointing out biases and how people are coming at it from different angles. And so if we're yeah, trying absolutely. to figure out what's right or not right, that we have to really consider the personal perspectives of the people involved and that the right answer for one person may not be the right answer for someone else. Yeah, I think that's, that's well said. And, you know, I think we all sort of value autonomy, we value health, and I think some people might value one, certain things over others, and I think that's just what, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so uh, Michael, let me just start by, so can you just tell us a little bit about marijuana? Like. Sure. Just, <laughs> just 
<laughs> in terms of uh, like, like, do you want to dive to you want to dive to like specific questions or you want to talk generally first? What do you think would be better? Um, well, I think one thing that would be helpful to sort of lay out there off the bat is just sort of definitions and word choice using. Sure. Um, and I think it's helpful to think about, you know, marijuana is such a broad term and even like the term medical marijuana can sort of be unhelpful because like, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about like recreational marijuana that's used for medical purposes? Are we talking about prescribed mm -hmm. cannabinoids that are used for medical purposes? Are we using, are we talking about like medical marijuana cards that we're getting and using for medical purposes? So I think it's sort of helpful to sort of break down what are the different types of substances that marijuana contains, what are the different forms of it and sort of how Yeah, that, that would be awesome. Can so you tell us? I think that, yeah. So when someone says uh, marijuana, what are the different things that that could refer to? Sure. I mean, I think one thing to think about is like, first off, that there's sort of this whole plant version of cannabis and that's sort of the traditional uh, sort of way that we that one might sort of inhale or smoke it. And, you know, there's different versions of it. Um, certainly, and sort of the most commonly talk about are like sativa or indica versions. There's other types of whole plants that might include tarpenes, which are like oils from like animal or plant products that might affect mm. the aroma or the taste of those products as well. And, you know, these whole plant cannabis products, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that it contains like hundreds of cannabinoids in them, like hundreds of chemicals that um, that are potentially sort of psychoactive. And so we don't, we haven't really scratched the surface in terms of what many of them do, but what the most common ones that we have been able to isolate and do a little bit of research on are things like Delta-9 uh, THC, which is sort of what we think about in terms of THC. There's Delta-8, which is sort of less studied and sort of less available in the whole plant as well. There's also CBD, cannabis, uh, cannabidiol, uh, which is sort of something that's sort of a lot of excitement around um, a lot of media attention and things like that uh, around CBD. And then you also have uh, cannabinol as well, which is sort of an emerging area. So I think it's sort of helpful to think about like whole plants and there's different ways to intake that, whether it be uh, sort of inhaled or whether it be through edible use or, or sort of other means. And then you have like these other cannabin uh, cannabinoids, uh, these sort of uh, compounds that you can since you can sort of uh, distill out of <laughs> out of the cannabis products that can be created or made into drugs that contain only sort of those types of uh, cannabinoids. Uh, some, uh, for example, dronabinol, also known as marinol, is a synthetic form of THC. Um, Epidiolex, which is like the only uh, FDA approved version of CBD that we have currently hmm. on the market, the only one that we've studied, um, you know, that's, um, you know, that's CBD, that's been synthesized. So it's kind of helpful to think about, you know, where are the different products, you know, CBD can be used in edibles and other oils and tinctures and uh, happy to get into the weeds of that if we need to, but I think it's helpful. Yeah, so, to uh, Michael, let me just ask you this. So, yeah. so in terms of when, so one of the things that I remember learning when I was in residency is that a lot of the original research on marijuana was done like 30 or 40 years ago. And that yeah. there's been like, um, basically as mar marijuana became more of a controlled substance, at least in the United States, that the amount of research on it, like maybe in the 90s and early 2000s, basically like kind of decreased significantly. And so one of the, the takeaways I remember having through some of my lectures when I was learning about this stuff is that the studies that we have on marijuana are maybe less applicable now because over the last 30 years, we've bred more potent strains, uh, concentrated the amount of THC so that even like, so, so in a sense, the the effects of marijuana that we sort of have well characterized from the 60s and 70s may not be quite as applicable today. Like, can you comment on that? Or is that kind of your experience? Because I'm I, I don't keep up too too heavily. I'm sure not as much as you do in terms of marijuana research. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. I think that's exactly right. I mean, when people talk about marijuana that's been used for like thousands of years, we think about like China being using it in 2000 BC for things like rheumatoid pain um, or other sources of pain or even sort of uh, mental health reasons. You know, the, the type of cannabis that was naturally growing in China or like Southern Russia, like had very little content of like THC. And, hmm. you know, we're talking about like less than two or 3%. 
Um, fast forward, you know, to the 60s or 70s, you know, people are using cannabis pretty widely and uh, sort of um, around the streets. We might have, you know, hear people say like back, you know, back in the day, people were using it all the time. It's not super harmful, like, and um, using it recreationally. And, and, you know, even around that time, like the THC average content you would find on the streets is somewhere around three to five percent. Um, fast forward to today, and I think a lot of this has to do with um, sort of the big industry of cannabis and sort of how we see trends in other areas of substance as well in the sense that, you know, trending towards higher potency and higher use and, and, and sort of desire to create those products. You know, a lot of, uh, if you're looking for like, for example, whole plant cannabis, like the stuff that people are using in the streets back in the seventies, the average nowadays is like 20, 30% and certain vapes can even go up and other products can go up to 60, 90%. So we're talking, the products that we're talking about today that are people are using and wondering if it could be helpful for mental health purposes are totally different from the things that, you know, we were talking about so, back in those days and, and, so and, just, and doing research off of. And just like to, to make sure I understood that correctly. Like, so when we're talking about like 60s and 70s or even like ancient cannabis use, we're talking THC in the, you said two to 3% range? Two to three percent. A lot of it's sort of like hash, hashish, or like um, sort of derived from the natural plant itself, and a lot of that, you know, has a lot of CBD and a higher CBD to THC ratio potentially as well. Um, but you know, strains of a higher THC content have been bred and used a lot more commonly and, in the last. And so you, you said that the 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 THC concentration now is like 20 to 30 percent so we're talking about like a tenfold increase in potency absolutely yeah and then and even in vapes and stuff you can you can get a 20 fold or 30 fold increase in potency yeah and so yeah, when you get a hit or a dab of that exactly you're you're getting you're what you're taking in in that moment is is much higher than people were ever sort of using in terms of concentration and you it. said that has to do with the industry can you talk a little bit about that what do you mean by the industry yeah i mean there's a lot of a sort of uh opinions on this and um and why this may be the case but i mean one thing to think about is uh, you know as weed was sort of decriminalized and, and um uh, legalized in many of the states and i think uh people were really like hoping that uh, sort of these dispensaries could be opened by like grassroots and that sort of treatment and healing can be taken by the people and there's sort of this anti-government even this whole rhetoric around that and I think it's kind of uh, unfortunate that with the legalization of medical marijuana on a state by state basis that um, a lot of the sort of dispensary licenses that are being handed out are being given to large industry cannabis dealers, which mm. many of which have been bought out by tobacco, by Big tab Tobacco. And Big Tobacco, as sort of many of us know, are incredibly good at marketing. They're incredibly mm. good at social marketing. They're incredibly good at like, you know, you know, coming up with ways of sort of mitigating sort of the ideas of how something could be harmful and trying to play up some of the uh, ideas of how something could be helpful. And so I think that's a part of it. And another part of it is, you know, uh, cannabis use also sort of like it follows demand as well. And we see, I mean, we look at the opioid sort of crisis, you know, and thinking about like what's available on the streets. You know, there used to be, you know, a lot of times it used to be like heroin on the streets. And then sort of drug dealers were realizing that, you know, if they can increase the potency of opioids on the street, then more people will buy it and then more people would get sort of hooked on it. And there's also sort of this tolerance that develops on opioids as well. Whereas, or like the, the more you use it, the more sort of desensitized the receptors in your brain are to using opioids. So the more you kind of need in order to get the same effect. So what drug dealers were realizing is that, you know, people need higher, higher doses and potency of opioids. And, and today, if you look on the streets, there's almost no like heroin, at least he here in Massachusetts. It's like mostly fentanyl and fentanyl is, again, by orders of like 10 degrees or like a higher, much higher order potency than even heroin was. And that's why part of the reason why we're seeing a huge increase in overdoses on opioids as well. 
And I think, you know, when thinking about um, uh, substances that where you can develop tolerance and substances that, that sort of people are trying to um, either potentially chase a symptom down or chase like a high, you know, and develop tolerance over time, there's going to be a, a demand for it. And I think industry kind of knows this. And I suspect that the potency in cannabis will get higher and so, higher. And that might help explain it. But that's only part of the picture picture. Yeah. So, so Michael, yeah. you're kind of, so if I'm hearing you correctly, like one thing is that as we increase potency and it's interesting, I didn't know that big tobacco had purchased a lot. First of all, I didn't know much about the landscape of cannabis dispensaries and stuff, but I mean, if big tobacco has essentially like purchased those and are kind of disseminating them, it makes me really wonder about, as you mentioned, they're good at marketing. Like you know, how much of what we hear about the benefits of marijuana and things like that are a result of marketing or yeah. other things like that. I'm also curious, so so as potency kind of increases, some people will say that marijuana cannot be addictive. Um, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, we've certainly seen um, cannabis addiction in, in our clinics here. And uh, what we know about sort of addiction to cannabis is that not everyone gets it, but uh, the more the more you use um, THC containing products, typically we're talking about like either, you know, the inhalable versions of uh, whole plant cannabis um, or vapes. And the more that you use it, the more frequently you use it and the higher content of THC in these products lends to a higher chance that you might develop addiction to it and people that do use it frequently say over two or three times a week we see around like 30 percent of people developing an addiction to it and i think you sort of uh, talked about a little bit of the mechanism of addiction and cannabis on the stream before um yeah why don't you just tell us a little bit about that so like like so mm -hmm. a lot of people will say you know um i don't i use marijuana for medical reasons like i mm -hmm. i you know because it is it is decriminalized now. You can get medical marijuana cards, at least in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, like, what do you, th you know, how do you tell if someone is using it? And oftentimes people who use it for medical reasons won't be, it won't be prescribed. They'll have never seen a mental health provider. They'll sort of mm -hmm. say, oh, I have anxiety and like marijuana helps with anxiety and that's why I use it. Um, how do you know if you're kind of like addicted to marijuana or not? I'm not hearing anything. Are y'all hearing anything? Did we get Jim muted somehow? Hello? Oh, say something. Hello, hello? Yeah, there we go. Oh. Uh, Keep going. So can you tell us how, how you determine if someone's addicted? Sure. Um, I mean, some of the signs that someone could be potentially addicted to cannabis are, uh, one, having cravings, especially early morning cravings, like waking up wanting cannabis as soon as you get up that's a potential sign another is using cannabis despite sort of knowing the consequences of it so examples of that are like you know i have patients who uh, have been using cannabis for a long time and it's impairing their work and as they use cannabis more and more and, and become more dependent on it, they were taking more and more risks with cannabis like using it right before meetings at work or during meetings even or stepping away and knowing that it's impairing their ability to function at their job but sort of not being able to uh, determine, like be able to make a sort of decision on that. And that goes back to the neurobiology of addiction that we make it to at some point. But um, also, um, what else? Yeah, well, using higher well, and higher doses of it over time. So developing what about tolerance. like, I mean, what about people who say like, let's say I have anxiety at work mm -hmm. and I find that you know, actually like using marijuana at work, like helps me perform better in a meeting. Right. Okay. So I think it, it really depends again on this, what we're talking about when we're talking cannabis um, in this moment. So, um, you know, we know that uh, there's some evidence that sort of um, CBD or higher CBD to THC ratio uh, cannabis products, or even sort of, um, sort of the newer kind of cannabis products are using kind of this entourage effect of various different 
terpenes and cannabis products to sort of lower the rate of getting high or the the, the hmm. chance of getting high while minimizing the psychoactive elements of cannabis like uh, THC and sort of the addictive potential that THC has and using utilizing other sort of cannabinoids that could be potentially helpful for social anxiety there there are some early uh, evidence trials that that some of these products um, could potentially be helpful for social anxiety um, but again um, I think one thing to mention here um, uh, we'll just take the example of social anxiety that uh, you know, in the studies that we have for social anxiety and other anxiety and depression, especially, uh, we'll just focus on CBD for now. Um, CBD edible products for this are, um, but you could probably also apply it for um, inhalable versions of high CBD to THC ratio products. Is that um, what we see in these studies? Is that, uh, and we're trying to f uh, still figure out the dose range for these element, uh, the uh, for treating these symptoms, but. Uh, what we see is that oftentimes, you know, in order to get a therapeutic effect, you need a certain on the, on the magnitude of like hundreds of CBD milligram and milligrams to sort of get the desired effect of some of these uh, products. But um, a lot of sort of what we're seeing, and at least from my experience, even going to dispensaries, is that a lot of these products that are being sold at dispensaries um, have a range of like five to ten milligrams of CBD. Hmm. And, you know, you really don't know what you're getting out of these uh, dispensary products either because it's not it's not regulated. So it's really frustrating. It's frustrating um, for me as a clinician in terms of helping a patient to navigate through using CBD, knowing that um, sort of it's an unregulated space. And um, there was sort of this um, study done out of uh, Mississippi, I believe, that we're looking at different cannabis dispensaries and their CBD products. And they looked at 25 different products of CBD um, at a dispensary and um, only three out of the 25, and they were measuring the CBD and, the, and sort of the THC content of these different products. And only three out of 25 of those products specifically in that area had CBD content that was like within 20% of what mm. they were saying. Wow. And there were like some products that were like, that had 0% of like CBD and it was just pure like berry gummies or something. And I think part of the, you know, I think part of what I'm getting at is like one, the sort of frustration of working in this space. It's kind of like, it kind of reminds me of back in like old school RuneScape or like Diablo days where you're like trying to make trades and things like that. But everyone out there is out to scam you except like <laughs> one every 10 people who actually wants to make a good trade with you. I've gotten scammed like numerous times in the runescape trying to trade items but like i ended up somehow uh in the wilderness somewhere and someone kills me i'm like how the heck did i fall for this one again and it's like it's like the wild west out there and yeah. like the fda has shut down like anyway they shut down or not shut down but they've really warned they've warned uh, sort of these dispensaries based off of it and i'm getting back to my point and that is that um the reason that we're seeing uh, even people who are taking this uh i believe we're seeing even people who are taking this completely sub therapeutic doses, meaning like five milligrams or zero milligrams of CBD and reporting like, oh, my anxiety is so much better. Like I'm getting, you know, I'm feeling so much better. And I think we really have to acknowledge that there's a huge placebo effect that we see um, mm -hmm. even in our like clinical trials for antidepressants. I mean, we're talking about like, like even thinking about like the, uh, the effects of uh, antidepressants on depression like about half of that effect is is sort of due to placebo, meaning like like even if you just gave like 100 people with social anxiety or with depression water pills, there was going to be a certain proportion, 20, 30, 40 percent of those people who say like this is this is great. This is really working for me. And, you know, yeah, so we'll start telling people about it. So this I, I can I can totally see how if people like marijuana, the placebo mm -hmm. effect from the therapeutic dose would be very high. Yeah, it, okay. it's, it's twice as high. I think studies showed that like, if you totally. believe something's going to work, like it, the likelihood of it actually working is twice as high. So you have, not only are you getting water pill, but you're, you're being told by somebody that it's going to help with anxiety. There's, there's a chance that it'll certainly help. And there's a much higher chance than if you were just giving a water pill on its own. So, yeah. uh, so Michael, just like, so let's just, uh, let me ask a question. So Let's say I've got depression or PTSD and people say like, oh, I, you know, I use marijuana to cope. What do you think about that? Yeah. Um, 
I think I'll start with PTSD. Um, I think PTSD is a hot topic for cannabis. Um, I think anywhere between like a third and like a half of people who are getting medical marijuana cards put down PTSD as their reason. So it's it's definitely something out there. And, you know, I, I really wish I could say, and I'm going to be focusing first on whole plant cannabis for now. Um, but, you know, I really wish I could say that, like, it's effective for PTSD, but but um, honestly, the trials have not really panned out well. Um, again, you know, the studies are limited. It's very difficult to, to study cannabis in the U.S. It's still a Schedule One drug, meaning it has high abuse potential in the same category as LSD, for example. Um, and so doing any clinical trials with it is very difficult, um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but at the same time, what we've seen is that you know in studies for example there are two big studies out of the veterans affairs hospitals where they tracked people who had uh, ptsd um, symptoms and, and started using cannabis and over time uh, people who use more cannabis and more and used it more frequently this is again talking about whole plant smoked cannabis um, the higher thc content and the more that they were using it the worsen uh, the worsening of their symptoms over time and uh, one study even showed out of like it was like a, a few hundred patients that they looked at when they stopped uh, using cannabis, many of them actually got had improvement in nightmares and, and anxiety. And then so you so you wonder like you know why is it that we hear um, you know a lot of people with PTSD find some sort of reprieve from whole plant smoked cannabis and feel like they're you know really improving their functional lifestyle, but why is it that this is not panning out in the mm. studies in the same way that even other psychedelics or antidepressants are are panning out in the studies? Like, why is there this, like, discrepancy here? And I think, you know, it's it's still sort of unclear, but I think if we dive into the neurobiology of it, um, it, it starts making sense. Um, How so? I'm going to do that. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, so cannabis. So let's start, start with, like, THC. Um, THC operates on a receptor in the body called CB1. And CB1 is located in many different places in the central nervous system. One of those places it's located on is the amygdala. So um, we know that um, sort of low doses, at low doses of THC, um, what happens is that there seems to be sort of an anxiolytic effect to the, to cannabis. Um, for example, you know they've tried to take they they've tried to extract just. Uh, THC into a pill called nabilone in very small doses, like 7.5 milligrams, may be helpful for anxiety and stress and stress symptoms. But what happens is that um, at higher doses of THC, um, the effect on um, the CB1 receptor actually flips. We see that it can create anxiogenic effects on the amygdala. And the amygdala, again, is is our fear center. It's It's sort of our emotion center, right? And so thinking about like the short-term effects on trauma and PTSD, and I think you might have mentioned this on stream, Alok, uh, maybe once, like in that some patients, especially in the initial dose of a whole plant cannabis, can have a um, anxiety response or even a trauma, a traumatic response, and that can linger over time. So there's definitely a risk to that. Then sort of what people were saying before for a while is that like, okay, if you get past that first stage, Things start getting better for you. And neurobiologically, what is going on there is that um, the receptors on... Let, let's pause the, for a second, okay, Michael. Let's, let's, let's just yeah, make sure we sure. recap. Okay, so our amygdala... So I, I noticed you're using yeah. some terminology, uh, so let's yeah. explain that. So yeah. the amygdala is your fear and survival center of the brain. So when we experience yeah. negative emotions, oftentimes our amygdala is acting up or is lit up, right? So when it's active, mm -hmm. we'll experience things like fear. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned anxiolytic and anxiogenic. So anxiolytic is the term uh, anxio, which is anxiety, and lytic, which means to lice or break apart. And so anxiolytic agents are things that reduce anxiety or break down anxiety, break apart anxiety. And anxiogenic yeah. are things that generate anxiety. So if I heard yes. you correctly, there's the, a CB1 receptor, which is a particular kind of cannabinoid receptor that's found in the amygdala, which is our fear center of the brain. And at low doses of THC, what that essentially does is 
acts on that receptor and reduces the amount of anxiety we feel. Is that correct? Yeah. The problem mm -hmm. is that at higher doses, it appears that the effect on the receptor changes, which for people who are out there listening is common, that at low doses, like particular, you know, pharmacological or like herbal compounds will work in a particular way. And then at higher doses, they'll start to work in different ways, or even they'll start to act on other receptors. And so if we take like low dose THC, it may have some kind of anxiety reducing property, but at higher doses of THC, it actually makes people feel more anxious and can almost have like a negative experience or traumatic experience. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's, that's fair to say. And, and can I just ask one or two questions about that real quick? So you're, you're familiar with K2, I'm sure, because you're doing residency yeah. in Boston and I did residency. Can you tell us a little bit about what K2 is, like chemically? Well, uh, my understanding of K2 is that it's a synthetic form of basically a cannabinoid. So, so when yeah. I was like working in emergency rooms in Boston several years ago, I remember seeing people who used K2 and they would be like very, very paranoid, very afraid and like quite psychotic and delusional. Do you yeah. have any idea if K2 acts kind of in the same way that you're talking about, where it like hyperactivates uh, CB1? Like, do we know anything about how K2 works? Because like K2 seems to induce, I, I've worked with patients who will have K2 and then it's a synthetic cannabinoid and they'll have like PTSD after using it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I've seen this too as well. Um, you know, we had a patient who took K2, really high functioning woman, and developed some really bad, really bad psychotic trip and had to get electroconvulsive therapy for weeks before they were sort of able to come down um, to somewhat sort of baseline. And, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure on the mechanism of K2, but it makes sense to me that it's probably working on, in a similar way on the CB1 receptor. And, you know, I haven't mentioned that CB, the CB1 receptor is on multiple areas of the brain, both like you know, we talked about the amygdala, uh, also in like the frontal cortex where a lot of our decision making, sort of our ability to like navigate things, our visual spatial, our motivation, drive, um, all of that, a lot of those things as well as regulating our emotions. A lot mm. of those centers are in the frontal cortex. There's a lot of CB1 receptors there. And there's also CB1 receptors in our temporal lobes. And these are the areas where, you know, um, that that are associated with visual effects or even like potential like psychotic effects. And we see um, sort of that, that that function as well. So um, absolutely. I think they're they're very related. So you were saying um, so just to, uh, so at higher doses of THC, we can get kind of anxiogenic or like it almost creates anxiety or paranoia or things like that. And how does that relate to PTSD again? Yeah, so. Um, what I was getting at is that what happens is um, that once you get past that hump and people say like, OK, your first trip might be bad, but if you keep <laughs> trying it, you, you won't have bad trips anymore. Okay. And like you, you start developing tolerance and it gets better and maybe even starts helping with symptoms. But um, what happens is um, that I'm going to give an example like like ganking and, and MOBA and like League of Legends or in Dota, right? Like if somebody is somebody is calling for a gank once and and you're like there's a reason for it you'll go to the lane and you'll help them out with ganking but if if somebody's like asking for a gank every two minutes because like oh my god like <laughs> this is a terrible matchup i need your help so badly we're never gonna win like <laughs> what happens is you start getting desensitized to listening to, that to to this person asking for your gank for a gank and you're like all right, I do. I like. I cannot keep ganking your lane. We're just going to lose the game. And I, I also just like <laughs> hearing your voice is really troubling. So, you know, we see the same thing happen with receptors. Like the more you, the more you activate the CB1 receptor, the it, it sort of desensitizes it to to um, uh, to the the cannabinoid, and it uh, downregulates. I mean, there's there's less receptors as well. So. I know this is getting deep into the science and I'm, I'll get to why, uh, you know, why I think it's important. And one thing is that um, over time, we see that um, there's also these CB1 receptors on the part of the brain that regulates emotion. So this is called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And 
um, stepping back a bit and thinking about like trauma and like PTSD, a lot of you know, trauma is our inability to overcome some overwhelming situation or over, or um, or emotion and our inability to process that. And trauma, a lot of sort of like when I what when our I, understanding of how, like when how I trauma call, when I call for a yeah. gank on my lane over and over and over again and no one shows up. What I said, uh, you, you, I was just making a joke. I was like, you're like, you were saying that trauma is our inability to overcome a profound emotional experience. And I was just saying like, when I'm calling for ganks over and over and over again, my team is AFK. That's that, that is also trauma. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so trauma is, you know, a, 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 uh, and, and tell me if I need to clarify things, but there's a part again, it's, it's where our amygdala. It's over firing and there's we lose a connection with the part of our brain that regulates emotion, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So over firing the middle of amygdala on its own and we lose this connection. So in terms of treating PTSD, we want to strengthen these connections between the part of our brain that can process emotions and the feeling of the emotion itself. We, um, that's just kind of simply. So speaking, how, how but, does how does canna how do cannabinoids fit into that? the ability for our frontal lobes to control or process our emotional experience. So what we see um, in PTSD is that over the long over the long term, because you have a desensitization of receptors on the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the um, the actual amount of neurons, it, neuron density in that part of your brain actually decreases. So the part of so the part of your brain that is there to regulate and identify negative emotions becomes desensitized and decreases in size. Interesting. So, so the ventral medial prefrontal cortex shrinks if you use yeah. marijuana regularly. Yeah. No. This we. Yeah. This is sort of imaging studies have, have sort of suggested this, and 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 what I'm trying to get at here is that um, is that. What happens when you when you take uh, sort of high THC products over the long term is that um, a lot of times you experience uh, people experience sort of this emotional blunting and sort of a difficulty being able to regulate the emotion itself. But their perception of the emotion of trauma and these symptoms can go down, but um, you're not actually addressing the underlying issue, which which is through the work of being able to regulate these emotions. Interesting. So I don't know if, I'm, if I'm making sense. Yeah, let me just see if I, I kind of got you. So, and I, I think this kind of makes sense. So, you know, if, if I'm using a substance just at a very high level, if I'm using a substance to numb my emotional state, my brain's ability to control and regulate my emotional state becomes less necessary. Mm -hmm. Right. If I'm numbing it, like my, my ventral medial prefrontal cortex doesn't need to do anything. Yeah. And as a result, like, so gen I mean, I, I don't know if we're really talking about atrophy or this is, you know, if we're talking about fMRI studies, I don't think anyone is looking at one patient longitudinally. Right. It's like yeah. average it took it, taking a hundred people who use marijuana versus a hundred people who don't use marijuana yeah. and comparing the, the relative averages of their brain size in this area. Yeah. So I, I think sort of what I, what I would assume is that you know, if our brain doesn't need to regulate our emotions, the part of our brain that regulates emotions kind of like checks out and possibly is smaller or something like that. Right. And so we don't need to regulate our emotions. Yeah. Um, the thing that I'm kind of curious about, which you sort of already answered is in a sense is that, so I'm kind of curious, Michael, do you think that it's people who have more trouble regulating emotions? Those are the ones who reach towards marijuana because they need a substance or like, since if, if I have an inability to regulate my internal emotional state, is that the cause of me using marijuana or is that a consequence of me using marijuana to numb myself and therefore like don't need to develop that part of my brain as much? Like, what do you think? Probably a little bit of both. Probably a little bit of both. Um, and yeah, I think we see that um, in, other, in other realms of research as well. Uh, for example, um, yeah, in in terms of uh, uh, in terms of looking at how isolation during the pandemic affects substance use, you know, we see that people who you know, feel a lot more isolated um, 
during the pandemic might have an even higher like reward response to using substances hmm. themselves as well and and might sort of go to substances as a way almost to help them self-regulate um too and yeah there's actually this interesting article on, on at the new on the new york times um that was talking about how like um opioids which is sort of you know different a different beast than than cannabis but uh, talking about how uh, people sort of view the relationship with opioid like like that of a good friend mm. in that like over time you sort of develop an attachment to the substance um, and a lot of that has to do with um you know the substance being the uh, sort of the pseudo person that's helping you process sure. and or most mostly regulate the feelings and and um and i think that makes a lot of sense in terms of thinking about um, cannabis as well and i've talked to people who who also have a similar sort of experience that like you know things aren't really going well in their relationships you know irl and um a lot of times people sort of look to and find these things that can sort of help replace that but then it's sort of like that friend that sort of seems really attractive at first and tells you really nice things but then kind of talks behind your back before you realize that you start losing your other friends and you're mm. also like what the heck man like what happened to all these other things so it's like that kind of friend so um, i mean do you think there is a because a, a lot of people are wondering so like if i'm hearing you michael like you know i'm not surprised at some of these conclusions because i think they're the similar ones to that the, what i came to is that yeah. you know a lot of people will experience some benefit from using marijuana but really if you look at the studies and stuff what you find is that if we look at some of these PTSD studies in, in, in the veteran population, which you were talking about, that there's a correlation between worsening PTSD and, and a higher exposure to THC over time. I wonder mm -hmm. a little bit about that's a chicken or egg thing, too. Is it that people who have worse PTSD are more likely to reach for marijuana? Or is it that using marijuana sort of numbs yourself and reduces your ability to control your emotions and then can make PTSD worse over time? I think you kind of addressed that because you mentioned that if you stop using marijuana and have PTSD, that you'll see an improvement of symptoms. So there does seem to be more of a causal relationship there, um, yeah. suggesting that marijuana is like really not good for PTSD. And again, we're talking about whole plant higher content of THC products using used frequently and uh, chronically for the diagnosis of PTSD. Yes. But yeah. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to make causal relationships with studies where you're not you know, testing out yeah. Yeah, cannabis. But this is sort of a current understanding of, of the impact. And, and so a, a lot of people are just wondering, like, is there a healthy way to use marijuana or is it OK if I just use marijuana to help me sleep at night? Like that's something that I hear a lot. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, certainly, possibly there there are healthy ways to use um, marijuana. Um, I'd say that um, using uh, products that are, you know, I, I would caution against sort of again high content THC products with whole plant for people who do have PTSD, for people who have psychotic disorders like schizophrenia or have family history of schizophrenia um, or other psychotic disorders or people who have bipolar disorder as well. Um, also, you know, I think it's important to talk about some of these harmful effects because uh, going to these dispensaries, you might not hear about some of these things from those people. And if I were go to go to a doctor and talk about medication, I would want to hear both sides. So before I kind of go into to the helpful aspects, I do want to lay um, out some of these things. And, um, you know, there are associations with um, hot, um, whole plant cannabis use for people who have asthma, uh, that it could worsen their symptoms. Um, people who have cardiac a cardiac history, it could lead to more arrhythmias and things like that. Um, I would caution against using it if you're under the age of 25 uh, because of its impact on the brain development. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, again, you know, this is sort of preliminary data, but the 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 data that we have right now is certainly concerning. That you know, during the development of the brain, which is um, for uh, for men, you know, up until the age of 25. Um, but during the development of the brain, uh, the uh, the mechanism is not clearly known, but cannabis use can uh, dysregulate um, the dopamine pathways that help develop 
uh, the parts of the brain, especially in the prefrontal cortex that are required for emotional processing, uh, for motivation, um, and for uh, uh, motor functions as well. And um, you know, what we see, for example, there was a couple studies that were done that took a look uh, in New Zealand that um, gave uh, or that, that tracked kids that were using cannabis over time. Um, early teenage years uh, to um, uh, all the way up until their 30s and 40s. What they saw was that um, in these people, they had, you know, executive function, like what I just talked about, like deficits, but there was also uh, for people who used cannabis from early age into uh, when they were older, there was a slight, but there was a significant drop in IQ from five to eight points. And when they stopped using cannabis later on in life, that didn't recover. So I think this is sort of the body of evidence that we take a look at and we're like, okay, we need to maybe be a little bit more hesitant in terms of, you know, and more mindful in terms of how we're using cannabis, especially, or again, we're back to talking about whole plant cannabis here, but when our kid, you know, and we're talking about potential lasting effects of cannabis for people with a developing brain, you know, again, thinking about like the impact on that and so um, there's certainly addiction psychiatrists um, in my field who are uh, pushing for sort of a higher like age limit for, for legalization. I'm not going to go into too much of that rhetoric there, but uh, other but all to say is that there's certainly some concern there, and that's why that's why that's being said. Yeah. So uh, uh, now now people who are listening to this are terrified. I think. You know, people who want to learn about cannabis oftentimes use cannabis, and people are now wondering how big is five to eight points? Like, what are we, what are we talking about here? What does that, what does that mean for people practically? Like, you know, if you have someone who's so, so what is, and, and so this is where you know we say, kind of we share. Sh let me just uh, jump in with this actually before I give Michael a chance to answer, but. So when we say, like, if y'all have questions, you should go see a licensed professional and have an actual conversation. I want to talk about that for a second. So we're, we don't say that just as a medical disclaimer. I think that this is like, if I'm hearing one thing from Michael that's very loud and clear, it's that you can't get a simple answer to these questions. So if you say, if you ask a question, which I get a lot, like, is it okay to use marijuana to sleep? Well, I think Michael's already demonstrated that when... There's so many things about that question that warrant individual evaluation or, or personalization, a personal answer. And the first thing that he's kind of emphasized is, okay, what do you mean by marijuana? Are you talking about, you know, like what THC content are you talking about? What THC to CBD ratio are you talking about? You know, like when you say to sleep, are we talking about are you using it every day to fall asleep or just certain nights? What are the reasons that you're having difficulty sleeping? Do you have an actual like insomnia? Is it depression? Is it poor sleep hygiene? Like what's going on there? Right. And so the, the biggest concern that I have oftentimes around marijuana usage, just in terms of like my clinical work, is that a lot of people will say, and I think we kind of see this even from some of the studies that he's citing that, oh, you know, I have PTSD, like it helps me like with my emotions. It helps me with my anxiety if I'm going to a party or something like that. We'll see people say things like that. Whereas, you know, my perspective as a clinician is like, okay, I'm not disputing that it helps you in some way, but the real question is like, what are we signing you up for long term? Is there some kind of underlying problem here that you're not addressing? Um, is it essentially a band aid that over time can cause problems? I've seen some really bad cases of things like cyclic vomiting syndrome, which you know, I, I think people who use marijuana, thankfully, most people don't get that. But once you get that, it's like very, very difficult to deal with. Um, and, and there are, you know, really bad outcomes from using Band-Aids, which is basically how I tend to view marijuana is that, you know, I've seen some clinical benefit. Generally speaking, the best clinical scenarios in which I've seen marijuana used tend to be in cancer patients or in people who have uh, really, really bad opiate addic addiction that's refractory to treatment. And sometimes you can use marijuana to reduce the opioid dependence and kind of like take the lesser of two evils. I've seen that done a couple of times. Um, and, and that's just because the, the risk of being addicted to opiates is just so huge that you kind of like, you know, need to get people off of it. 
But I, I think it's like really important. I, hopefully y'all are taking this away as well, that like what I'm getting from Michael is that it's like subtle and nuanced and individualized. And so people will ask questions like, is it okay if I do X, Y, Z? And that's where my answer is that like, it kind of depends on what's the circumstances. You know, what's your long-term plan? Is it like, okay, like even if you're using marijuana to sleep right now, you know, is your plan to just continue to use marijuana to sleep for the next 40 years of your life? Like that doesn't sound like a good plan to me. Anyway, I, I kind of jumped in and interrupted you, um, but. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And um, coming back to the idea of sleep, there is certainly um, some evidence that, again, going back to CBD products and high and smoked uh, products that are higher in CBD to THC can potentially sort of decrease the amount of time it takes for you to fall asleep and uh, prolong the amount of sleep you have. But what we see in THC products is that it can get in the way of, um, while it can potentially help somebody fall asleep, it does give people like less quality sleep over time by reducing REM. What do you REM. mean by that? So REM is like rapid eye movement part of your sleep. And that, that's important for a lot a range of things, including like processing, contextual processing and um, uh, like filtering and, and processing like emotions that happen during the day. Um, as well as physical benefits as well, ranging from the immune system to cardiovascular, et cetera. And you know, we see this a lot in medications in general for sleep that yes, they can be used short term. If you're gonna use it, like talk to your doctor, obviously, first of all, but you know, thinking about short term, like a few weeks, or not up not any higher than like three to six months, you know, try to you could try to use something like that in conjunction with uh, working with your doctor, but knowing that, you know, there are sort of long-term side effects to that and focusing on other sort of behavioral uh, interventions to sleep, which include like sleep hygiene, for example, um, you know, reducing the amount of um, sort of electronic exposure late at night. Um, yeah, I think you had like total, uh, You, I think you've talked about sleep uh, before, but, um, yeah, like associating your bed just for sleep and sex and nothing sort of else. Don't you don't do work and things like that with uh, in your bed. Sort of this uh, uh, arousal response mechanism. Um, associating your bed with things that are that help you relax and get to sleep. So, um, so I would say you know I would try to avoid whole plant smoked cannabis for for sleep as of this time. There's not really great evidence for it uh, for most of those products. Again, th you know there's some excitement around sort of this like higher CBD to THC ratio or these like products that have these terpene and entourage effects that can mitigate potentially the THC levels and reduce the amount of time that the high feeling. Um, but I think the jury is still out on those kinds of products. And I mean, what I mean by that is like they've tested these on rats so far um, and mice. And, you know, I think you need more evidence in the human sort of clinical setting before we can make conclusions on that. And we know, you know anyone who's worked in the biotech space at all knows that things that work in animal models rarely sort of pan out well in human trials. So I think I think there's just there's a lot of excitement. I I think I'm with like s some of that for sure. But um, in terms of a doctor recommending it for sleep, like it's it we're not really at that level yet. And I do want to mention right now there's only four FDA approved indications for cannabis like at this moment. And what now, are those? Epidiolex for um, childhood seizures. There's two rare types of childhood seizures with French names that I'm not going to try to butcher. Um, I believe there's, um, you know, appetite stimulation um, in, uh, in patients with eating disorders and nausea in patients with chemotherapy. And, you know, I mentioned some of the um, uh, synthetic uh, forms of cannabinoids that have come out to help treat, to help address these things. But, um, Interesting. Outside of that, so the FDA has basically taken a look at all the evidence so far, and they basically said there's nothing outside of those four that we have enough evidence to suggest that to say to people like it actually works for these things. So that's that's kind of where we're at with a lot of this. So Michael, like, so um, you know, if we say that okay, marijuana is like not good to use long term for sleep, like, what do you think about people who kind of equate or assume that marijuana is going to be the same as like sleeping medications or, or, 
you know, sleep meds like that. Both of those are going to be bad. They're kind of equally effective or ineffective. You don't want to develop a, a dependence on a sleep medicine as well. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, you know, we see, I, I think you mentioned like sort of the Band-Aid effect. And I think that's how a lot of people who are doing the science of and the studies on it are really seeing cannabis. And cannabis is very different from benzodiazepines in terms of the mechanisms of action, but they they both also work on similar neurotransmitters as well. And we see this as well with benzodiazepines, but that yes, it can be helpful for sleep, but long-term we, we really try to minimize use over the long-term uh, because of those things. But, you know, if you... You know, if you have, uh, if you're if you're given like the options of different sleep medications that have been well studied, and that have potential use, you know, if you tried all of those and you want to try cannabis because those are not working, I think that's that's sort of the place where I would recommend people uh, try it out and navigate it with their their doctors, just because we just have more studies and other things than we do for things like plant THC for, for sleep. Now, CBD might be a different story, um, but kind of similar story in that, you know, again, try other things, but you're not going to die from trying CBD. I mean, you're not going to die from THC, but the harmful effects of CBD don't seem to be as as high as that of THC, um, both like in the short term and, um, and you know, jury's still out in terms of long term, but there's nothing that's come out yet that is completely jarring. So, and the reason to go for sleep medications that are prescribed, if I'm hearing you, is that we basically have more science behind them. Yeah, I would say that's the case. I mean, you mentioned uh, other things as well, like cannabis for opioid use disorder. Like if somebody came to me with opioid use disorder, you know, I would really do them a disjustice by saying like, hey, let's let's try cannabis for this, like off the bat, because we have life-saving medications like you know, we have Suboxone, Buprenorphine, you know, we have so much evidence for these other life-saving medications. For me not to take a look at these medications that have... Oh, I wasn't talking about evidence, opioid use you know. disorder, by the way. I was well, talking I, about I pain I'm management. Just... Pain management? Yeah, sorry. If oh, I for misspoke. that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I may have okay. actually misspoke. That's fair enough. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. But, but it, it's a similar way. Like, I... I think typically how doctors like us, you know, how we see new medications, especially ones that are unstudied, is that, you know, um, I think we want to be cautiously optimistic about it because we don't want to do harm to our patients and we do want to provide the most like evidence-based medications for somebody's um, symptoms. So, um, yeah. So, so yeah. Michael, what do you think about, so we've, we've got kind of like two or three different tracks, which I think people are really curious about. One is, um, you know, the relationship between particular illnesses. So for example, you mentioned that if you have like a family history of schizophrenia, like you should really, really stay away from marijuana. Um, can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? I, so I think that the two kind of divisions that we've got, and maybe what we can do is poll chat if we've got a mod, but we can ask kind of like about questions around, you know, what's the relationship between marijuana use and things like schizophrenia or marijuana use and bipolar disorder or the, the other route that we can go down is a lot of people have questions about, you know, can I safely use it? Um, you know, is what what about recreational use? Uh, and then other things that people have also talked about, which is like, you know, incorporating I'll see this basically every now and then, maybe one at least once a month on the meditation subreddit, where people are talking about using marijuana versus not using marijuana while meditating. Or um, we also know that, for example, some of these more psychedelic compounds that have been used in spiritual traditions for a long time are now being studied for certain things like depression and PTSD. Um, do you have a particular direction that you'd prefer to go, or you think it's important to talk about? Um. I'm happy to to go with whatever the chat wants. So whatever, you know, okay. uh, all those topics are interesting to me. I don't think there's a one particular. Uh, um, let me see if I can set yeah. this. Okay, we've got a poll running. So it looks like. Uh, so it looks like um, people are curious about safe recreational use, the most. So what do you think? I mean, if someone asks, "Can I use weed safely recreationally?" What do you think about that? I think, like you said before, it, it's a tough question uh, to to address because that really depends on uh, what 
is sort of the rec what are, what are we talking about in terms of the recreational use of a uh, of a substance and what sort of underlying conditions do people have that could that could corroborate with that now let's say in a perfect world somebody you know do, you know doesn't have ptsd or bipolar or family history of schizophrenia perfect world you know they don't have any history of cardiovascular disease they're above the age of 25 um, they're not pregnant um, and um, don't have sort of the pulmonary things that we'd be worried about in terms of smoke cannabis use. Um, can you use it recreationally? I would say one that like, um, as much as you can kind of use it to the point when you're not getting high, like that, like I think using CBD, for example, maybe if you're, I mean, people equate like drinking red wine or something like that, like could that be something to using it at night to help sort of relax you Maybe um, at low doses like that, it's kind of like chamomile tea. Um, if you're going to use uh, cannabis products, if you're going to use smoke cannabis products, and that's kind of what you've decided recreationally, then I would just say try to stick with ones that are lower in THC content, like less than 10 or 20%, and try not to go above that amount because, again, the risks that we see with it are, are sort of in the higher doses than that. And try to use it as less frequently as possible and be honest with yourself. Why are you using it? Because if I think a lot of people do say like they're using it recreationally or for pleasure, then you know they ask themselves it's probably some symptom that they're addressing. And unless like the symptoms are sort of like addressed and talked about um, in other ways, like that. Oh, like, hold on yeah. a second, Michael. Did I hear you correctly? So so you think recreational uses? Uh, I was kind of confused by some of the dosing you talked about. So I'm not really too familiar with marijuana, like in terms of it, people don't really use it in my social circles and stuff like that. But yeah. I mean, I thought the whole point behind recreational use is that people like to get high, like they like to be, yeah. you know, and, and so, uh, and isn't that sort of what we're talking about here is like using it to the point of, you know, high potency kind of THC sort of stuff. Like when people say uh, recreational use to me, I, I don't think I've never heard of someone who uses recreational marijuana. Maybe this is uh, due to the selection bias. And like I mentioned, it's not like I, I in my social circles, they're very popular to use. But, um, you know, I've never heard of the marijuana equivalent of dr drinking one glass of red wine with dinner. Like it's almost always what I hear about is people you know, using for the purpose of, of really getting high, like they're shooting for that sort of effect recreationally. I, I don't know. Well, it's just strange. Maybe it's once again, the selection bias of who I've hung out with in the past sure. and, you know, yeah. more, so I I know more that importantly, who I haven't hung out with, but. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say people have various reasons why they might use cannabis. Um, one could be the sort of the euphoric effect from getting high. Other people might use it sort of a, a calming or sort of relaxation, kind of like a couch sort of relaxation mode that, mm -hmm. and some people might not be necessarily chasing the high for it. So I would, I would consider that there are other ways of using it recreationally. Okay. Um, and um, there are certainly ways of microdosing cannabis so that it doesn't get you sort of that euphoric effect um, that comes with the high. Um, and, you know, if you're, in terms of just re specifically relating to mental health, um, it's it's really unclear, and it's hard for me as a doctor to say like, okay, go, <laughs> go and get high like every day. Like it's probably not going to affect like or every other day. It's just the data there is just really unclear, and so I can't really say like certain what the impact of mental health will be if you're chasing a high and if you're doing that daily. But what I can say is that many people do develop over time effects from that and it's hard for me to tell people that like okay this is safe to do if that makes sense yeah so i i would just say caution if, if you're going to use it to get high like would i i would caution that's with like um i think one you know i guess we talked about one thing that happens sort of when you're getting high there's sort of this like inhibitory mechanism that happens in your brain um the the frontal cortex helps like inhibit your thoughts, right? But, like if you're chasing the high for creativity or euphoria. It's kind of like playing 
like it's like it's kind of like opening loot boxes, but like ones that are are like completely like kind of a little bit more rigged sometimes against you. And what How I mean so? by that is like it helps. So a lot of people experience the high as like this this idea of like openness and having a lot of interesting sort of insights and thoughts about self reflection and other thoughts that could be like completely um, divergent. Uh, meaning like example like we've we've heard about like artists and ceos like using it for creative reasons in terms of getting high because a lot of it has to do with a divergent form of like creativity meaning like getting all sorts of different ideas out there that are sort of an out of the box style thing but the tough part about it is that um i get that it's fun and and it's enjoyable and like to each their own but the tough part about about like being open to all of these ideas is that you know you you talk about on your stream like machines and we've talked about like paranoia and psychosis and all of these things like you're like rolling the dice each like you're kind of gambling a little bit because you don't know like um like you the, the openness is is very inclusive and what we're not hearing is like the people who do use it to get high that um ultimately like may potentially give them certain thought machines or ideas about themselves that they start to believe and then maybe later on develop into other things. And so, um, no, it's, it's, I think that whether or not, you know, getting high will have a significant impact on your health. If you're just doing it like once a month or something like that, and you don't have those other conditions I've talked about, is it going to have a significant impact on your mental health per se? Probably not. But is that something you're chasing very frequently? And that's something that, you know, it's, it's it's like a little bit of a gamble each time you're doing it. And so we're, we hear a lot of positive examples of like people like having creative thoughts on it. But then I think as clinicians, we see sometimes these negative examples of people who use it recreationally and have a hard time engaging with us in therapy or, or being able to think properly yeah. or function at work and things like that. So it's a tough question. Uh, when in terms of in terms of the high aspect, yeah, I think a couple of thoughts about that. One is that, so in my experience, like, like you mentioned, so some people will talk about the benefits of it, and and what I tend to find is that there's like, if someone successful talks about marijuana use, people love it so much that it kind of floats to the top of the internet, because mm -hmm. everyone who loves marijuana is like, see. This person did it and they're okay. Whereas, you know, what you don't see floating to the top of the internet is, you know, like the vast majority of, you know, I mean, we see this stuff, right, in, in the emergency room when we're on call overnight about whether they be college students or homeless, uh, part of the homeless population or just all the people that use marijuana regularly who sort of don't end up in a good place. I think another thing that really concerns me is that what I what I tend to find, especially like a little bit in our community, is that people will say that they have particular problems, which I, you know, I totally respect. They'll say, oh, you know, I struggle with social anxiety or I'm, I struggle to find motivation. I, I can't put together my life. And what I oftentimes will find is if I assess them for marijuana use, there's like a significantly higher percentage than, let's say, the average population. And so mm -hmm. some, one of the things that concerns me about marijuana is that it, I don't think it's directly responsible, but I think it sort of synergizes with a lot of other problems. So for example, like there's a very high comorbidity between video game addiction and marijuana addiction. Um, and so I re even remember looking into the neuroscience of this and was really surprised. So one thing that I sort of noticed is that there was a group of people that I worked with that had a lot of trouble, like forming new habits. So that they were kind of in this bad cycle and like they couldn't get out of that bad cycle. And I got kind of curious about that. A lot of them would use marijuana very regularly as well. And so was really surprised to discover that a lot of the habit circuitry in the brain is actually like governed by cannabinoid receptors. So the formation, so when you are doing something for the first time, and you get that sort of like reward from it, that's got, or like if you do something for the first time and you kind of enjoy it, or like that behavioral reinforcement in the early stages is actually governed by dopamine and the nucleus accumbens. But as we start developing habits, we kind of shift from the nucleus accumbens and our dopamine circuitry 
to cannabinoid circuitry in different parts of the brain. And it, mm. I almost got the impression that when you mess up, mess with your dopamine circuitry and cannabinoid circuitry, it makes it hard for you to learn from your mistakes and form new habits. Now, there's some neuroscience, like basic science kind of support of that when the, you know, if you look at broadly speaking, the receptors involved. But I don't think that there's, I haven't really seen many studies that go into that degree of sophistication on habit formation and the brains of people who are using substances. But it really seems to make sense to me because when those people end up getting sober off of marijuana, I tend to find that their motivation and their ability to form healthy habits seems to improve drastically. Now, whether that's a direct effect of like no longer having cannabinoid stimulation in your habit circuitry, or it is a consequence of no, no longer numbing yourself and like getting in touch with your emotions more, doing more emotional processing so that you can find your motivation and stuff. I don't know. But those are the, the couple of things that I think about. And then the last thing is that, you know, I, I get this question a lot where people will ask me, like, can I use marijuana recreationally? And I think you kind of touched on this or, or mentioned it some, but what is recreationally? Right. What are we really talking about? And I, I've almost, you know, when I ask more details and this could be a selection bias as well, because, you know, being a psychiatrist, I'm going to get a particular kind of person in my office. But what I tend to find is that when people talk about recreationally, like they're usually referring to multiple times a week, like they're not talking about once a month. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that's it's just a, you know. And I'm curious, maybe we can do a poll on that too. When, for those of you that are recreational marijuana users, how often are you talking about using it rec recreationally? You know, is it more than once a day, once a day, multiple times a week, once a week, or like once a month? Okay, so everyone seems to be, we'll see if there, an actual poll comes up, but I mean, people are talking, I can't tell if they're trolling or not, but. I mean, it seems like the majority of them are saying daily, if not multiple times a day. But we'll see if there's a poll comes up. What do you think about that? So, uh, again, are we talking like whole plants, inhalable cannabis use daily or multiple times a day? Can you be doing that in a way that is is healthy. Is okay. That the so, so it looks like, so here's the poll results. Okay. So how often do you use recreational marijuana? 50% of people say more than once a day. 16% um, of people say once a day, 16% of people say once a week, 5% uh, of people say once a month and 16% of people say less than once a month. So I'd say that you know, the numbers are changing a little bit, but 60% of people who talk about recreational marijuana use are referring to it at least once a day. Yeah. Yeah. And it so. looks like about 40% of people are once a week or less, which has been my experience. So I, I'd say two thirds of people are like using it once a day or, you know, a few times a week. Yeah. I think one thing we talked about is like not everyone who does use it every day develops an addiction to that. So in terms of thinking about like, is it going to be problematic from that perspective? Like, you ha people have to just kind of know their own limitations and know what's going on there, and and certainly you know that could be done potentially, safely from an addiction perspective. Now, uh, will how would that impact your brain in the long term? How will that impact your mental health in the long term? I mean, it's really hard not to think about sort of what we have with our association studies with like daily use. And a lot of the studies have usually used like two or three times a day or like three times a day or more as like sort of a heavier use of cannabis. It's hard not to think that there's going to be some risk involved with motivation, uh, some risk involved with uh, just like executive function or thinking and some risk involved with uh, being like emotional processing when you're using it that much. You know this risk and you feel you feel like risks don't outweigh the benefits like who am i to say like that this is not something that that you should be doing but um it's i think that there are certainly just risks that you have to be aware of you know as you're doing that and i think another thing that's worth mentioning is that we are really bad human beings are really bad at assessing our own cognition like we have parts of our brain 
that can assess maybe how sleepy we are. We have parts of our brain that can maybe assess like what our emotions are, you know, when we're in a good place. But there's when when our frontal cortex, which is processing things, is like failing, there's no part of your brain that's saying like, okay, your executive functions at 60% of normal now. There's we are really bad at it. I mean, like you look no further than like people who are like, you know, challenging like professional smash players if you're a complete noob and like because you think that you're amazing, you know, and because your friends are amazing. Like like because because you're amazing amongst your friends. Like um, you know, we we're just not good at assessing our own abilities and cognition. Or like if we're like playing video games and it's like the eighth or ninth hour and we're like, okay, let's do one more game, I'm fine, dude. Like I'm totally fine, I'm with it. Like we we're not great at doing this. And we see this also in driving studies and sleep studies as well, that we're just not great at assessing it. And so what do we what should we look at as a marker for like how we're doing cognitively when we're on these things? Uh, my opinion is that you know, just as with gaming, we have to look at like the people around us and what they think about how our use is, is affecting our cognition and come up with objective markers, either through getting a diary and like doing, you know, writing out your feelings during the day, writing out like your thoughts and how you're doing functionally and, and things like that. And um, we also see, you know, there's a study, um, I think in 2017, where they looked at people who were using cannabis for creativity and what it showed is that the people who use cannabis felt like they had more divergent, meaning like more different ideas in terms of creativity, especially among uh, creative arts. But when they assessed, like during that time, like they actually looked back and assessed like what products of art they made and whether or not they would consider that to be a productive or creative art in retrospect. There was no difference with with like placebo. Like, Essentially, essentially, what the study suggested was that that like when we're when when we use cannabis, you know, we feel more creative. We feel this euphoria. It's a good feeling. But whether or not like we're actually producing something creative, we're creative. whether or not we're actually doing something productive with the time. Like and I've talked to people who are like, yeah, like I felt really good, but then writing a song or like doing something with it, but then. When I got out of that trip and I looked back, I was like, okay, wait, this is just kind of garbage. Like, you know, so I think we just had to just, you know, all I can talk about are the risks. Like every person is different. And, you know, if you've weighed all those risks and for yourself, the benefits still outweigh, like who am I to say? Well, I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, I, I get what you're saying in terms of, you know, the most we can do here is sort of share the risks, but I think that's kind of important to understand. Like what you just said, I want to kind of like focus on that for a second. So I think the challenge with a lot of substances is that we just have poor awareness, right? Of what the substance, first of all, like if we're really using it recreationally or not, I mean, when I think about, so 40%, 43% of chat was saying that they use it more than once a day when they think about recreational use. So that's like a staggering number, right? That's like higher than what I was expecting, but, um, and so we're sort of poor judges. You mentioned, I think the cognition studies are important because I, I have found that when I work with people who are using substances and are especially like don't really think that they have a problem or maybe, you know, they're kind of like in the pre-contemplative stage of stages of change, but they sort of don't really like, they think it's recreational and they sort of what I oftentimes find is that there's very poor awareness of like what's actually going on with its use. And if you sit down and really tunnel down into, OK, like what allows you like what makes it recreational? There's a lot of things that you're using it for, like e even if it's that, OK, yeah, I use it because I want to have fun, but like I can't have fun because I'm so worried about my future and the only way that I can like enjoy myself on a day is like in and have recreation is to get rid of the existential dread of everything that's going wrong in the world and in my life and then like you know i i do that through marijuana yeah. Yeah, i agree completely it, it's a tricky business too because when you let's in, in people who you know once you i think you talked about sort of pathway of like chronic heavy use in terms of the dependence you know initially there's sort of a positive dopamine spike to it. There's sort of a pleasure feeling to it. But over time, you know, these dopamine re receptors, like they become downregulated and yada, yada. I'm just going to say that end result is that, you know, our, the dopamine response that we have to things outside of the substance becomes way lower. Our, our ability to derive pleasure outside of 
whatever it is that substance that we might be dependent on is lower. And you know, people sort of describe this hypodopaminergic depression that can happen. So what that means is can that you once you're getting that, to that yeah. stage, yeah. So once you get to that stage where sort of you're not deriving pleasure from other things because the dopamine response to things outside the substance substance is just mitigated because of the neurobiology that goes on, we start feeling depressed. And the only thing that can get us to sort of even a baseline level of feeling is that substance itself. We see this with opioids, we see this with cannabis. So, so it, the tricky part is that when you're at that stage, um, taking cannabis or taking other things, like it feels like it's improving your depression because without it, you feel really depressed. Nothing gives you pleasure, cannabis. And the, the tricky part too that I found in terms of especially like helping people to understand how cannabis might be affecting their mind is that um, when they stop taking it, there's this withdrawal effect too. If you if 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 dependence and 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 the use disorder is, is at play here, there's this withdrawal effect that makes people feel depressed and anxious. So what happens is it's like people come up to me and tell me like, hey, I've been trying to come off of this, but I'm actually way depressed and way more anxious off of it than I'm onto it. So I'm going to come back onto it. But you know, part of part of the discussion of like you know, if somebody does have a dependence or addiction is, is, is talking them through that there is a withdrawal phase where you will feel much worse. And that doesn't mean that like the cannabis has been treating you the whole time and has been doing a good job of that. It could very well mean that you're withdrawing from it. And part of our job here together is to, to kind of slowly come off of it in a way that's safe and that in a way that can help mitigate some of those effects as well. In your experience, Michael, how long does it take to recover from that hypo dopaminergic depression that you're talking about? Like how long does it, because what we're talking about here is neurobiological tolerance, right? So, so it's almost like caffeine where like, if I never drink caffeine and I drink a cup of coffee, it'll keep me up all night. But if I drink coffee every day and I wake up, I'm barely functional without caffeine. Whereas if I detox off of caffeine, I'll be perfectly functional in the morning. So we're talking, you're referring, this hypodopaminergic depression, you're talking about tolerance, right? Yeah, and I guess caffeine is kind of a microcosm of it, but yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, sure. So, so you know, what, so like there's some people who were, you know, terrifying <laughs> with our discussion, people who have been using marijuana since their teenage years and are afraid that they've burned their IQ points and are very hopeless because they use every day. And, you know, when they stop using, they experience a lot of these like negative emotions like anxiety or depression what what are we what are they kind of in for ballpark in terms of like if i stop let's say i'm a daily user of marijuana just kind of gut check and i recognize this is probably highly individual as well but you know what am i in for like how long before i start equilibriating and can sort of get rid of that hypodopaminergic depression in terms of hypodopaminergic depression, because we're talking about regulation at the receptor level, this can oftentimes take months, even up to a year. Like it's it's a tough process. And you know, I think that's why, you know, coming off of sort of a high level of heavy cannabis use safely and or not safely, uh, like in a way that's sort of more comfortable, it does take time and it and, and typically it, like a tapering effect can be helpful, like coming down by like 10 or 20%, like every month or two, something like that, gra a gradual taper with, you know, there's medications out there as well that can help mitigate these withdrawal symptoms too, and that can help make it a little bit more tolerable. Um, obviously, doing this with, with somebody who who's experienced, um, you know, the counseling and therapy is gonna be important, you know, things like that, but, you know, a lot of these, if if there are symptoms of like lack of motivation, executive function, um, uh, emotional processing, a lot of these symptoms, especially like people who started using, you know, in their adult years, can be reversible. Like once you come off of it, um, so there's def there is hope, and you know, my hope is that you know that at, in terms of the field of medicine, that we can be better at um, being able to manage these these aspects because, you know, frankly speaking, you know, many providers out there, you know, they did, a, they did like a survey study like a few years ago within like the last few five years and like only half of primary care doctors were comfortable really talking about cannabis with their patients. Wow. So in terms of thinking about like, how can we, 
be able to engage with people in an informed way, help them to think about the risks and benefits properly with their cannabis use. I mean, obviously we have a lot of research to do to be able to do that, but a lot of it also has to be like, we, we need to be more informed and, and more helpful to people in terms of navigating these spaces than, than we have been. And I think that's, um, I think that's a frustration point as a provider, but a, a totally a, a frustration point for people as well who are just wanting to use these substances or wanting to use them for helpful things, but finding that either access to them or getting information for them is really difficult. So. Um, so let's let's turn to a couple of these other things that you mentioned. So you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, having a family history of, of schizophrenia as like basically a contraindication is the medical term we use. So, you know, if, if you've had a history of schizophrenia, either yourself or in your family members, you should steer clear of weed. What's the relationship between uh, illnesses like schizophrenia and marijuana use? Yeah, sure. So I think there's a couple um, sort of links that we... Uh, understand here and again like the evidence is still the body of evidence is still growing but you know one thing that is really kind of signaled out in the studies are that people who have a family history of schizophrenia or have a genetic predisposition to schizophrenia um, based on a dose dependent manner meaning the higher THC content of cannabis you use and the more frequently you use that um, and develop sort of are more likely to express their underlying genetic sort of predisposition to and express schizophrenia earlier in their life and are more likely to express it, like four to six times higher likelihood than if they didn't use cannabis at all. So that's why we try to caution against using for people who have uh, psychotic disorders. But psychosis is, we talk about long-term psychosis, but then in terms of short-term, uh, we also caution people who have schizophrenia you know, from using THC containing whole cannabis products, um, especially of high THC content, again, because um, it can increase the, the, um, the likelihood of them expressing um, psychotic symptoms. I have a patient I've been you know, treating with for like a few years now, and uh, every time he, this person decompensates, it's because they're using cannabis and it, it you know, leads to sort of more sort of uh, uh, hallucinations and voices and things like that. I think one thing we haven't mentioned that's important to mention as well is that cannabis can interact with medications as well. Mm. That's sort of an important point to be talking to your doctor about. And I'll give you an example of this, that like when you use a smoked product like cannabis, it can um, basically uh, operate on an enzyme in your liver that can, that can uh, change the doses of certain medications that you're taking. So for example, in patient schizophrenia, coming back to the example, this person was on Zyprexa or Lanzapine, which is an, an antipsychotic, and using cannabis and higher doses of it can actually reduce the amount of the antipsychotic that you're getting in your system. So another reason why you know we caution people from using cannabis, especially on certain medications, is that it can it not only can contribute to these episodes, but it can also limit the amount your medications can are actually helping you. So it's kind of a double whammy there um, in, a, in a, a difficult way. So that's kind of why we we sort of see it that way for schizophrenia um, and other psychotic. Yeah. And let me just make sure I got this. So it sounds like if you have a family history of schizophrenia and you use, you know, as you mentioned, whole, <laughs> what did you call it? Whole plant? Yeah. Whole plant forms of cannabis, cannabis that have hot or high THC, THC contents. Yeah. It increases. So if, if we just think about this for a second, just because you have a family a history of schizophrenia does not mean like if you're parents or one of them had schizophrenia, let's say, it doesn't mean that you're going to grow up and, and have schizophrenia. But what we do know is that there's a genetic component that increases your risk of having schizophrenia. Then mm. the problem is that studies show that essentially if you, let's say I have one, let's say I have a parent with schizophrenia. So I have a certain risk of getting it myself. And I'm not sure exactly what that is. I imagine it's less than 50%. It's probably what, like 20%, 30%. Uh, I, I, I think it's it's still you know significantly less than fifty percent of memory serves, um, and then the challenge though is imagine you have two kids in that family and they both are let's say born with a twenty percent risk of developing schizophrenia, and one of them uses a heavy amount of marijuana during their developmental years. What you mentioned is a four to six fold increase in risk, right? So and increase in risk of developing it in their lifetime and 
increased risk of them developing, expressing it early on in their lifetime is yeah. also something that we've seen. This so, so the other interesting thing there when he, when I think when Michael's talking about expressing it early on, so there's also data that shows that the earlier you get affected by schizophrenia, generally speaking, the worse that you do. So like people who get schizophrenia at an early age and, for example, don't finish college um, and aren't able to enter the workforce in like a substantial way, like those people tend to have worse outcomes in life. Like they're not as financially independent. Their, their symptoms can get worse and things like that too. So part of what we also see with people who use marijuana is that they'll get an earlier... Um, they'll get earlier that they'll sort of get schizophrenia earlier, which then sort of impacts their life kind of more profoundly. It's almost like, you know, it has like a snowballing effect is, is kind of the takeaway that I had from the people that I've worked with. And so really using it early is like, can have a, a profound negative impact on the trajectory of your life, even though it feels like at the age of 14 or 15, if you take a week or a month that you're using versus not using, it may not feel like that big of a deal. But if it increases your risk and you manifest schizophrenia earlier and you're unable to finish school and things like that, that kind of stuff like snowballs. And then like you're 20 years old, like you're not in college and then you kind of feel behind and you have difficulty like socializing with other people and that stuff. Then, then you kind of get like more depressed. And I've seen these cases, unfortunately, a fair amount where people just really struggle and the, the better cases I've seen definitely happen to people who are, you know, get schizophrenia a little bit later in life and have more stability around them, have more sort of social supports and things like that around them. And they tend to do a lot better. Um, yeah, certainly the earlier you start using it, sort of the, the greater, risk, especially starting in during childhood. Um, and, and what about and things like bipolar disorder? Like what's your what's your take on marijuana usage and depression or other kinds of mood disorders? Yeah, I mean, there's, um, starting with depression, uh, there's not really good evidence that whole plant cannabis use is helpful for depression. I think we talked about this hypodopaminergic depression that we see um, in people who do use it sort of chronically and long-term. Um, some small evidence, uh, I think we talked about, well, there's some uh, trials, especially short-term use of CBD for PTSD. The same thing with uh, depression that, um, you know, CBD uh, operates on like the CB2 receptor, but it also operates on a serotonin receptor called the 5-HT1, uh, which, um, you know, can be implicated in depression, can be implicated in anxiety, uh, cognitive flexibility as well, or sort of our ability to change the way we perceive or think about things. And that's sort of how we think that ketamine might work as well. So working on sort of a receptor that um, could potentially have therapeutic benefits for. I'm sorry, um, can you say that the 5-HT1 receptor you said um, is affected by CBD? Yes. Interesting. So it, that. does it have, is there some suggestion that there's a therapeutic benefit there or it, it like messes with the receptor in a negative way, or do we not know? No, we, there's, there's certainly a signal that there could be a, a therapeutic benefit. I think the, the most, uh, again, you know, these are sort of sort of limited evidence, uh, open label, meaning not controlled trials. Um, people know what they're taking. So there is that placebo risk, but, um, you know, social anxiety, CBD for social anxiety is one area of like a lot of interest. And I think there is, um, evidence that that could be used potentially, um, uh, for PTSD symptoms as well, uh, especially nightmares, uh, flashbacks, things like that. I've had patients who um, have used CBD and that's been helpful. Um, and um, uh, depression somewhat, insomnia is sort of, uh, hmm. there's some evidence for that as well, but it's sort of not as fleshed out as some of these anxiety uh, disorders are, but there's definitely some excitement around that. And I think some of that is, is founded. Um, you know, there's some evidence for you know, in autism and, and sort of aggression, irritability, um, maybe ADHD. I mean, we have like a smorgasbord of different things, um, but um, I think the especially social anxiety and PTSD, um, that's sort of where we've seen garnered some some interesting like positive evidence for. So, um, so, so Michael, yeah. I notice, I, I mean, maybe you can explain this. You'll say there's some evidence for or there's excitement. Can you help us understand like what that means? Does that mean that there's some evidence for CBD's benefit on the 5-HT1 
serotonin receptor. Therefore, I can smoke weed as long as it's got CBT in it. Like, what is it when you say some evidence for or excitement? What do those terms mean? Help us understand. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I'm meaning like uh, concentrated so forms of CBD in like uh, like epidiolex, for example, which is a CBD version of it, it is basically CBD that's um, sort of a prescribed uh, uh, um, pharmaceutical and you know, looking at uh, use in 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 conditions like social anxiety and PTSD, we've seen in short term, like we're talking about eight week trials, like people who take somewhere in the range of like 200 to 400 milligrams ish, and we're still trying to figure out where this dose range is, like the the I mean, we as in like the medical community, that um, you know there there is some evidence that 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 um, people who do use uh, CBD over a period of time can and you know develop improvements in in these symptoms and not have sort of the um, sort of the psychoact there so CBD itself sort of doesn't have the kind of psychoactive effect um, that THC has um, psychoactive as in like sort of the psychotic producing effects or the anxiety producing effects that THC have and sort of our understanding right now is that it doesn't have sort of the, the addictive potential, not nearly as much as we see in THC. And CBD can even, you know, there's some evidence that shows that it could even sort of start reversing some of these aspects when combined with THC. So I think that's where, you know, there is some excitement, meaning like excitement as in, in the media or in sort of even like some very early trials in animal models that like if you combine CBD THC and other elements as well, you might be able to come up with a personalized product that may be able to alleviate certain symptoms you have without giving you that high that could then produce, you know, that may have other problematic effects and um, that might, you know, help you with that condition. But it's still very early on in terms of evidence, you know, in, in the sense that like it's too early for people to like start recommending it. Yeah. So, so just to kind of like add some context around that. So, you know, if we think about a clinical trial or we think about how science is conducted, you can have, so Michael mentioned an open label kind of trial. So, so we think about the gold standard of scientific evidence is the randomized controlled trial, which I personally don't think is a gold standard, but that's a conversation for a different day. But, um, so the, the whole point is that, you know, you have two groups, they're randomized, so there's no selection bias into who gets put into one group versus another group. We have controls in place, so like we're controlling for things like age and gender and other kinds of things. So there, there are ways that we can conduct science that give us a strong amount of confidence that we can make a recommendation. And, and right now, what I'm getting from Michael is that the trials on CBD and stuff haven't reached that level of scientific vigor. So what we sort of have is we may have, we'll take, uh, we'll do a survey of, let's say, 30 people who use CBD, and we'll ask them, how much does it help your anxiety? And those 30 people will say, it seems to help a lot. And so then what we'll do is, is scientists will say, okay, so there's like some kind of signal here. But we have no idea. We haven't controlled for biases. We haven't controlled for doses. We haven't controlled, like, we don't really know what they're using or how often they're using. So we haven't controlled for all this stuff. So, like, even though there's there's kind of like a bright point on the horizon that, hey, maybe there's something here of value, we haven't conducted enough rigorous scientific trials to sort of really determine, okay, this is a good idea or this is safe. And, and I, what I'm getting from, and even if we look at like a lot of the research on psychedelics and stuff, like that's kind of where things are now, although psychedelics in some cases are a little bit further along, but you know, it's like, it's sort of like, we'll do an initial study with a small number of people without adequate controls and we'll sort of figure out, okay, is there something here worth looking into a little bit further? And then we'll do a bigger trial with more people and more controls. And then we'll try to duplicate that trial and then we'll do a bigger trial and then we'll really start to do like dose kind of trials where, okay, what about 200 versus 100 or 200 versus 400 or 200 versus five? And then, so what's the right dose that you need to get this kind of like benefit that we're talking about in terms of 5-HT1 kind of activity that makes like reduces anxiety. 
And so this is really for, for us to have scientific confidence that, hey, as a medical doctor, we can, or as the medical profession, we can say that this works or doesn't work. I think this is where, like, there's a lot of confusion, I think, in, in the lay public about, like, you know, the levels of evidence that we really have to get to and that you can have a trial that's very promising early on. But and even Michael mentioned like animal models. So people will do things with rats and they'll they'll, you know, assess depression in rats and they'll give them CBD at mega doses. Because the other thing about rat trials, if you ever look at the dosing, is it's absurd. They'll give rats, you know, a hundred times the dose per weight that you would give a human. And then they'll sort of see some kind of like promising effect. Um, and anyway, so I, I just wanted to kind of like make sure that people understood the context around, you know, promising and excitement and, and it looks like there's some possibility. And for people to really understand that, you know, when Michael says something like that, I, I as much as people, we got just got to be a little bit careful about like to what extent people are interpreting that as, oh, this is safe to do or this is a good idea. Because I don't think we're really there yet. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with that completely. Um, and so, so you, we've talked a little bit about mood, psychotic disorders. A anything else that you kind of want to talk about today? We've been at this for about almost two hours now. Um, trying to think. Yeah, I think one thing to mention, just along the lines of just CBD, is that you know, as much as I think. Uh, people are feeling sort of the frustration that there's like a lot of these uh, ideas and products out there. And, you know, as doctors, we're not kind of ready to start prescribing using them. And at the same time, you know, I'm feeling that as well in the sense that like, even if the evidence were to be there, we're still kind of far from being able to prescribe something like a dialex or something like anxiety or social anxiety. Epidiolex is, again, the only thing that we could get on formulary here in the hospital. But even now, like insurance would not cover epidiolex, which is CBD again. You know, they, it wouldn't cover, like at this time, uh, that for like indications in sort of the mental health realm. So, and, and the cost is like tens of thousands of dollars. We're talking like very expensive. So I think, I think some of the frustration is that like, Know, even obtaining the CBD for trials or even trying to use it in clinical practice in you know, with patients that maybe, you know, are not responding well to other medications or wanted to use it in addition to those medications is very difficult right now. I think that's kind of why, like, we have we as kind of doctors have to really, yeah, at this time, like, really help our patients to navigate this field so, in a way that's So some people safe. are also kind of talking a little bit about here we are as two doctors talking about this stuff. Um, how do you think, so how, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this question. So, you know, there's an argument to be made that since we don't use marijuana, we don't really understand the benefits and we don't really understand what we're talking about. How, mm -hmm. how would you, what do you think about that? Right. So here we are, like, we're sort of like in our ivory towers in academia, sort of talking about these studies and stuff like that. How do we weigh you know, what we have to say against someone who's actually like used marijuana and is familiar with it and can speak much more personally to the benefits of creativity and, you know, how it sort of helped them in so many different ways and helped them make friends and stuff like that. Because that is the experience that some people will describe, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we, I think as doctors, we sort of tend to talk in terms of like probability and, and in terms of studies. And we, kind of like public health sort of promoting people. And that's sort of a bias because we want to look at populations and we want to have populations grow sort of in a healthy way. That there is bias in that in acknowledging that there are people who might be using these things safely and not really like impacting sort of their mental health or other things in ways that were are coming out of these trials, but sort of um, using it in those ways but you know we you know obviously without our personal experience in it in that in that sort of way and um in our bias there like we're that's something that we we don't have sort of uh, insight into um i think we we have like a high bar for like sort of evidence and trials and things like that before we use things we're very sort of adverse 
be effective sort of people as a field. It takes a while for us to be convinced that something works and that something helps. And I mean, part of that reason is that we would hate for us as doctors to like recommend something and then all of a sudden we find out later how bad it is. And we, we've seen that being the case for opioids, for example. And I'm not saying cannabis is like opioids, but I'm all I'm saying is that like we have a pretty high bar for being able to say like, okay, this is something that's safe to do and this is something that you should be doing among all these conditions. And I think that, um, I think there is certainly a bias for that as well. And, um, uh, but, you know, I think, I think it's helpful to listen to different sources and conversations about it. And we might be able to speak to the harmful effects a little bit better. And other people might be able to, be able to speak to the per, their personal experiences better, way better than us. And, I, you know, I think it would be completely, this is why I talked about bias in the beginning, because it would be completely sort of untruthful to say that, um, you know, that we are able to provide a full picture of the experience of cannabis and um, an unbiased source. If anyone tells you they're unbiased, they're, they're, they are lying to you because it's either, it's going to, there's going to be bias to every sort of every experience. So I hope yeah. this is sort of just a part of people's experience as they engage with. So I, I, I think you, I liked a couple of the things that you mentioned, Michael, like, so the first is that as medical professionals, we tend to be more sensitive to the adverse effects than the benefits, right? So our profession is one where, you know, if something helps people 75% of the time, but hurts people 25% of the time, that is a terrible medical treatment. So if we just look at like the rates of like adverse events, we tend, you know, that's not something that we would, I think, almost ever use, right? The only examples that I can think of of, you know, things that have that kind of therapeutic index are like chemotherapy and stuff like that, where it's like dire, dire situations. But generally speaking, you know, I, I think that's, that's a big piece. I think another big piece is, uh, so we tend to be more risk averse is physicians than I think some sometimes people who use marijuana are. Go that's ahead. The word that I meant to use, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We, we tend to be like very like medicine has a bias of being like very risk averse, right? If you think about like you go to your doctor and they give you a treatment and it has an eighty percent chance of working and a twenty percent chance of causing harm, like no one would ever go to that doctor. As as a field, we tend to be we have a bias towards being risk averse. So we would rather do something that is effective like 95% of the time and even like less effective, I would take half efficacy at a 95% success rate over like, you know, 95% efficacy 50% of the time. And then like of a high chance of like causing damage. Like we just, that, that's a, a good inherent bias. I think the other thing to remember is that a lot of people who are, you know, proponents of marijuana use, I don't know exactly what their sample size is. And this is where in medicine, we also have a bias towards public health, right? So I, I've worked with people that have had very, very positive experiences with marijuana that they say, you know, hasn't negatively affected them at all. And that's great. But what I'm really concerned about, this is also true. I mean, so I, I've done a lot of this in terms of alternative medicine as well, where there is a ton of alternative medicine, which I've found to be very, very efficacious and shockingly so which I almost never talk about because it has low reliability. So it may be transformative for one person's life, but like half of the people who try it get no benefit or it even can hurt them. And so I think the, the other big bias that we have in, in medicine is that we tend to be like, so we're going to undervalue an individual's experience compared to what the average expected experience is going to be. So we make decisions probabilistically. Like I, I remember when I was in residency, you know, I learned a very important lesson, which is that someone could ask me a question. If I have major depressive disorder and you start me on this medication, or if, if there is a patient that has major depressive disorder and you start them on an antidepressant medication, what, is, what amount of benefit can you expect? I can answer that question. But if someone walks into my office and says, I have major depressive disorder, if you start me on this medication, what, what benefit do you, do you think I'll get? And that's like actually a, a lot harder of a question because we can answer questions about populations at whole because that's what clinical trials look at. They look at 10,000 people and what's the average effect size. But what happens in that 10,000 
person trial is that, you know, 3,000 of those people get way better. 3,000 of those people get like a little bit better. And 3,000 of those people don't really get better at all. And then we average all those numbers together and we get sort of this like this effect size, which we then expect. But once you start practicing clinically, what you begin to realize is that even though you can expect an average effect size, there's actually like a high degree of variance between individual people and their experience, their responses to something like marijuana. Um, yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think for any, like, and I think, you know, applying that bias then to sort of whole plant cannabis, you know, if we see something like you said that could have potential adverse effects, our bar for being convinced that the benefits are going to outweigh that risk is going to be much higher. Right? Our bar for whole plant cannabis to like, like saying that it could be safe and helpful for people with mental health is going to be a lot higher if we see that there are also a lot of people who may be having these adverse effects. And, you know, with CBD, our bar, I mean, our bar for like, sort of helping someone navigate through that is going to be slightly lower than with whole plant cannabis because we know that the side effects, most are like gastrointestinal when we get to the hundreds of milligrams or like liver toxicity and things like that. But we kind of know how to manage that a little bit. And there's a little bit, you know, we, we've seen clinical trials of CBD and Epidiolex for seizure disorders. We kind of know like short term, maybe a little bit like longer term what it's going to do. And there's some certainty around that. Hmm whole plant again has so many chemicals beyond thc and cbd we just don't know yet given the uncertainty and given the potential adverse effects like you know as clinicians it's like our bar just goes that much higher in terms of like thinking about it and, and whether or not it's going to be safe or effective so uh, michael have you talked about delta 8 thc have we talked about that because a lot of people are curious about delta 8 thc yeah i mean i I don't know too much about that, to be very honest. And, you know, we as a field, you know, it's something that's hard to sort of purify out of the plant itself because there's very low amounts of it compared to Delta 9. So it's not, that's not something I would be comfortable sort of talking sure. about in the sense that, like, I don't, I don't know of the good evidence for or against it. So I'll, I'll sort of leave out myself out of that conversation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's fair, right? So, so, and I think one thing to remember, uh, as, as Michael mentioned, is that I remember seeing this study. There was a, a paper, I think, by Rich Saper. I, I don't know if you ran across him, but I think he's at Brigham or BI. But who was looking at, like, the amount of, like, what's in herbal formulation. So if you, like, go to the store and you, like, buy a bottle of, you know, turmeric or something like that. What they actually found is very similar to what you were describing, which is I think nine out of 16 brands that they randomly sampled had little to no of the compound that was advertised. If you actually like check it by, I think, uh, gas spectrometry or something like that, I forget, or chromatography, I forget what they used. But um, and, you know, seven out of 16 had some of it, but oftentimes like three or four of those had like lower amounts than what they claimed was in it. So I think the other thing to just be super careful about, and, and this is why, you know, I, I think some people are also concerned about us being like anti-marijuana. And I think that's where, like, you've got to be careful. I, I don't know that we're anti-marijuana, but at some point, like, you can look at the evidence and you can sort of form a conclusion. And so we've, I, I think Michael's done a good job of sort of sharing what our biases are, right? So we tend to be risk averse. We tend to be population focused. So any individual person may say, oh, but marijuana works fantastic for me. I think the problem is that when you follow what that person says, what is the likelihood that your experience is going to mirror that individual person's experience? I think that's where, and you can make an argument against this, but I think that like, you know, the experience of it, your experience isn't going to match perfectly the average of 10,000 people's experiences. But I think over time, if you base your decisions on the average, you're more likely to do well over time. Right. So we're going to have that kind of bias. And you just have to be super careful with things like Delta 8 THC, because I have no idea who's regulating that. Right. What are you actually getting? And the other problem that we see a lot with this stuff like, you know, fentanyl overdoses and things like that is not only is fentanyl more potent, but like there's no like I don't know how to say this, but when you get stuff from a drug dealer, there's no guarantee of quality. Right. There's you just don't have that. So, so that's where the risk is so much higher. 
for Delta 8 THC, maybe what you're just getting is, is you know, some inert substance that because of your placebo effect and because of the echo chamber of your social circle, you think has this awesome effect. But there's just no way of like controlling that information. And so that's why, you know, I, I think that generally speaking, I'm very hesitant about marijuana use. I'm very hesitant about recommending it. Um, on balance, I'd say like, don't do drugs, kids. And there's a reason why we say that, right? And the good news is that thankfully, I think science is sort of progressing to where we're, we're open-minded about stuff. So we are studying these things like psilocybin. We are studying these things like MDMA and their therapeutic effects. Um, we are studying marijuana and its therapeutic effects some. I, I mean, it's, it's hard to do that research, I think, as, as Michael mentioned. But in the meantime, like, it's just I, I've just seen so many people get screwed so hard by marijuana that, like, I can't recommend that anyone uses it outside of these specific, as Michael's mentioned, you know, FDA approved kind of situations. Because those are the situations in which on balance, like the the risks far out, I mean, the benefits far outweigh the risks. Uh, yeah, with you uh, there, and you know, there are companies out there uh, that try to um, like test I'm like using sort of lab results, like the different contents of like CBD, sort of go off of what you were saying earlier. Um, you know, I'm not prom going to promote sort of any resources per se, but like Consumer Lab is something that it is unfortunately like a paid subscription, but it's something that I, that I've used to to navigate like what um, how much content of CBD or THC are in certain products, and they they try to do a good job, and I can't say like how accurate they are. With it, but I um, all to say is like as a consumer, like definitely be as informed as you can about these products and don't take for face value, like um, sort of what you're told about it, even here in this room. And um, and you know, there's always going to be biases. I mean, the opposite end of things as well. Like we see, you know, we we recommend let's say like people with depression, antidepressants, but there's going to be a small proportion of people. You know, even though we see that antidepressants are effective for many just have a negative effect from it or don't have any effect at all and sort of for their experience they may feel like you know it's something that's not helpful at all or even have a negative expense uh, negative effect or you know develop suicidal thoughts later on and you know can have their own experiences of it that you know we don't capture and we you know i think there are certain biases there as well and it's, it's totally fair to say that like you know their experiences are completely valid um, and um you know, and sort of their, you know, people's understanding of the field of psychiatry or even cannabis in general. And you know, everyone sort of is you know, privy sort of to their own perspectives and views and, and should go to different sources to get permission, yeah. ones that are more valid than others. So, well, thanks a lot, Michael. Um, do you want to, or do you want to share a little bit about if you want to, where people can kind of find you in terms of socials and stuff like that, or you want to just steer clear of that? Um, sure. I mean, I do have a Twitter. It's something that I, you know, haven't been using that often, but it's something that if people want to engage in more conversation about, I'm totally up for it. Um, it's, you know, I, I've mostly been using that to share papers and journals and things like that and to connect with people in the field. But um, it's at Michael HSUMD on Twitter. So happy to do that. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming yeah. on and, and sharing, you know, your your experience and expertise on cannabis. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate it, man. Take care. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Alan. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. I mean, what did you what did y'all think about that? Like. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about schizophrenia. Right. Yeah. So, you know, j just to kind of like, so I, I've been following chat and some people are saying, wow, chat is so, so toxic. So let's, let's like go reach to some of our HG roots for a second and talk a little bit about, okay. So if you're watching something like this and you feel combative or you feel upset, or you feel attacked, right? So what I what I tend to find is that when people talk about subjects that are charged for some people, 
the most important thing for you to do is to like understand why is what they're saying bothering me. Like I've seen these different kinds of, you know, comments about like, you know, anyway, just people will say, oh, there's successful people who use weed and stuff like that. So like, just think about that for a second, like forget about the statement and whether it's true or not. And that's kind of, I think what Michael and and I's point was, we're not saying that there aren't successful people who use weed. That's not what our job is as medical professionals. I mean, even here, I'm not really acting as a medical professional, but when I'm, you know, when we think about when I'm sitting with a patient, the reason that I can't recommend it is not like we don't recommend things based on the fact that there are successful people who have done it. So, for example, I've also met successful people who have been divorced twice and are on their third marriage and are happily married. And at the same time, just because there are people who are who have been married three times and are happy in their third marriage does not mean that I can recommend marrying someone who's been divorced twice in search of a happy marriage. Does that make sense? Like, there are going to be cases of that, right? But there's still, like, you can play the odds. And and that's where I think, like, in my opinion, you know, marijuana's kind of problematic there. Because if you look at the odds, we tend to be, it tends to not look great. So that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place somewhere. It's just, based on the odds, it's not great. The, the next thing that, and kind of going back to what I was saying, is like if you feel like arguing with us or you feel like this is big pharma or whatever whatever, whatever y'all want to do, it, it's fine. You can have those opinions. But what I would really focus on if you really want to like understand yourself better, which is ultimately what we're, we're just going to disseminate the information based on our experience and expertise. And you can dispute that if you want to. That's totally fine. Neither of us ever claim, by the way, that we're, you know, know everything about marijuana. It's just we're sharing what we've learned. But if you get supercharged or triggered by what we're saying, like I would start by exploring where that comes from, right? So if if you, because I think like Michael was fantastic. He's like the very beginning, he's like, everyone's got biases. We've got biases. And we've tr- done our best to even share what those biases are. But if you kind of default to like, oh, big pharma, like, I mean, I've seen comments that, you know, sleeping medication and marijuana is no different like that. I disagree with, right? Because like, and, and that's where like, I, I do think there's a big difference because one of them has been rigorously studied and the other has not. One of them, when you get a prescription for a sleep medication, the dose that you're getting is, is je- basically speaking guaranteed. Whereas when you buy marijuana, I mean, one of the big things that Michael emphasizes is that even the studies that we have on marijuana are from like the days when it, the THC concentra- concentration was two to 3%. Now it's like 20 to 30%. So like, how does that affect what we can expect in terms of therapeutic value. We have no idea. So I think there's a lot of stuff that's different about medication versus marijuana. And y'all can say, oh my God, I'm I'm a a shill for pharma, which is fine. But I I mean, we don't really, we're not here recommending particular medications on stream, right? Like we may at some point, who knows? But generally speaking, like that's not something that we do. And so this is where, you know, if, if you're reacting strongly to this, I, and even if you're reacting strongly in like a positive way, like I would explore where that reaction is coming from. So if you watch this stream and then the next thing that you're going to do is go to your friend, brother, sister, significant other kid and say, hey, watch the stream. See, I've told you that marijuana is bad. And now these two people on Twitch are saying that marijuana is bad. See, see, I told you. So check yourself there because what are you reacting to? So we're just sharing information. And if you're reacting strongly to this in either direction, like start by understanding what that reaction is. Like, why do I feel so strongly about this subject? And sometimes it's, you know, it comes down to like what we was like recreation use. Like we mentioned, there was a question about, oh, like, what do you think about recreational use? And, and like, you know, Michael was like, oh, I guess if you like use it once a month, like I can see how, and then we asked chat, but like no one who's talking about recreational, very few people or not very few. We have the statistics, right? So based on a, Poll of Twitch chat, 43% of people who are talking about recreational use are talking about more than once a day. Another 16 to 70% are talking about once a day. So we're sitting at like 60% of people are talking about daily use when when they're talking about recreational, which is very different from the answer that Michael gave in terms of his assumptions about what recreational use was. That was my experience as well, which is like, generally speaking, it's like the numbers high. Right. And, and like 16 or 17 percent was like less than once a month. Now, this wasn't a scientific study. It's not a random sampling. 
who knows who's trolling in this kind of thing. But th this is my point is that like there's this is such a nuanced and individual topic that I think, first of all, y'all should be as informed as you can be. Secondly, be critical of it. Right. So everyone keeps on mentioning Snoop Dogg, which is like, sure, like, you know, I, I would love to talk to Snoop Dogg about his experiences of marijuana. Right. Because he may have a different perspective to share. And, and that's where it's like, you know, that's the whole point is like what we try to do here is share perspectives. Even when we talk about things like Ayurveda or even like clinical explanations of psychiatry or meditation, what we're doing is sharing perspective. We've never claimed to be the arbiters of truth. What we've done is a fair amount of research. We have a fair amount of experience, and it's our job to try to share that with y'all and for y'all to think critically about what we say and decide what works for you and what doesn't. And especially when it comes to marijuana usage, highly, highly recommend for all of the reasons that we've said. When we say go see a doctor about this stuff, the reason for that is not like just go see a doctor. It's like to understand that, you know, if you are using it to having trouble, difficulty sleeping, there could be all kinds of reasons that you're having difficulty sleeping. Why not address the, the root of the insomnia? Maybe you've got sleep apnea. Like who, has, who knows? If you've got social anxiety, maybe you're hyperthyroid. Did y'all know that feeling anxious, like part of the differential diagnosis for that is getting uh, is, is a high level of thyroid hormone? This is why we recommend medical treatment and sort of individualized, personalized decisions, especially when it comes to things like marijuana. Because I don't think there is a one size fits all answer, because even if we say on average, we wouldn't recommend it. There are people out there who are sort of saying, but there are successful people who are on weed. I use it recreationally. It doesn't really bother me, things like that, so on and so forth, which is fine. We're not disputing that at all. It's just, if you're trying to make a decision, how do you know what the odds are, right? Because you have no idea, like if someone else uses, like, you know, Snoop Dogg uses marijuana or so I have heard and very successful, very creative, you know, if he says it's a huge part of his success, like that's fine. Like the question is though. If I were to take, you know, a thousand people who make music and use marijuana, like where are they in terms of their success? Right. So I've heard I, I've never seen them do it. I've never seen a drug test. Right. I don't know. And, and that's the real challenge with this stuff, because what happens is once your mind likes a substance, then what it does is elicit its own cognitive biases. So I don't like, so this is like, we're going to talk for a second about the addict's mind. So the addict's mind, once it likes something, it will find whatever information it can to like support what it wants to do and will vigorously attack anything that disagrees with it. And if you guys have had someone who's like in denial before, you'll sort of see that, right? And so how do we know whether we can trust our mind? That's what I'm saying is judge your own reaction to what we're saying. Forget about what I'm, say what, what I'm saying is right or wrong. What's your reaction to it? Because that'll give you an insight into your own bias. Right? And like, it's not our place to say you should do something or you shouldn't do something, like in terms of a moral, personal judgment. We can say that, okay, and th that's why I think Michael, if you paid attention, he's talking about the risks, right? This is what we know from the research. This is kind of why we say what we do. And if you're like pushing back against what we're saying, it's kind of like, you know, just think a little bit about where is that pushback coming from? And if you start to say that we're, you know, pharma shills, like that's, you know, they surely aren't paying me enough if I'm a pharma shill. But that's just where I, being a clinician, I've, I've worked with a thousand people who have smoked marijuana. I've worked with a thousand people who have taken antidepressants. And I've seen like, on average, there's a pretty different effect from both of those. Generally speaking, when I work with people, you know, who come in smoking marijuana, they tend to do better when we stop. And, and there's even, you know, if you look at like the VA, the Veterans Affairs, the veteran study that Michael talked about, people will use it to manage their anxiety or PTSD or whatever, right? Because it gives you the subjective sense of, okay, this is really helping my anxiety. But then over time, your symptoms are actually getting worse. And that's where that's a really important bias to understand about the mind, which is that we don't know when our, our cognition is impaired. We don't actually know. We have a subjective sense of what our creative output is, but we don't actually like measure it, right? We don't do that as humans. We just have a sense. My mind is like, oh, this is good. 
And then if your mind likes something and is addicted to something, it's going to overinflate the value of it in terms of an objective sense. And so it's, it's just tricky. Like it's sneaky, sneaky mind. So be careful about that. 